Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament book of Job. We uh, have finally arrived at that part of the book where God has his say in this. And it starts at chapter 38 and runs through chapter 42. We will take care of that. We're going to do this over two weeks. And so uh, this will be part one of the two parts where God begins to answer. What I want to do here at the very beginning is uh, um, put up on the screen just some observations that are really quick. In case you're the uh, type of person that takes notes, um, I'm going to do these kind of in rapid fire. But I think that there's an importance about this because of the previous 37 chapters and all of the things that have been said. When God goes to answer all of these questions, he um, he he really does some very interesting things in, in the way that he addresses Job and also the uh, the people who would have been giving counsel to Job. Sometimes he speaks directly at Job, and there are other times that uh, it seems that the audience is a bit more general to the, to the people who were supposed to give him counsel. Uh, it would really have good application to pretty much all of them, because uh, all of them made wild assumptions. But of course, this is now the place of accountability, mostly directed towards Job, but ultimately in the last chapter directed towards his counselors. Um, oddly enough, Elihu, the last one who said a, a bunch of things presumptuously, uh, isn't mentioned here. Now, before I get to this little quick list of things, the, the one last thing that I want to uh, kind of bring up here, there is, there is these, the final uh, five chapters. And we can only assume that this is the whole of God's dialogue back to Job, but there is potential also that, um, that there are other things that may very well have been said that we don't have record of. And really the reason I say that is uh, kind of the first of the things on the list that I'd like for us to, to kind of think of as, uh, as kind of our takeaways from this. The first of, of all of the observations that I'd like to point out is the fact that God never actually addresses the underlying problem. What was the cause of it? The things that we saw in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And really at 38, what we have is Job got what he had actually asked for. He wanted his audience with God, and now he has it. Um, there is also that Job made, uh, is, is shown, it is, it is made known to Job that the creation itself is dependent upon God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no end to it. And yet there were those times when it appeared as though God was just not paying attention to things. And so God's answers here are going to make it very much evident that the whole of creation is absolutely dependent upon him 100% of the time, and there is never a time when it is not. Um, so it means that he is intimately aware of all things at all times, going right along with what I had just said, that the entirety of the creation is dependent upon his existence. Um, and then all of the questions that, that uh, God actually asks of Job, they are all rhetorical. They are not answer, or they're not questions to which God seeks an answer. They're rather said so that Job is now accountable for all of the assumptions that he made. And so um, God really ultimately answers all of the assumptions made about him, whether it is from Job's mouth or whether it was from his, uh, his counselors and those people who looked to allegedly comfort him, or at least that's the way that it began. As we've also studied, it became much more adversarial at the end of it. But isn't it interesting, now that we get a chance to go back and kind of take it all in and look back at everything that was said, here now God is able to answer all of these things, whether directly or indirectly, and he opens up so much more of Job's understanding. And from that list that I had just put up, probably the one that he seems to, Job, when he looks back on it, is he didn't really fully grasp how how directly and intimately God was with his creation in, in the way that he interacted with it and its dependence upon him. And so, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing if we're going to look at it in the application part of it, we as believers. Things just happen so automatically. We get up, you know, in the morning, we go to sleep at night, we just kind of... Everything is on its cycle and we get kind of locked into doing those things. And it is easy, though it's not deliberate and it's nothing. there's nothing malicious about it, but it's very easy for us to forget the, the very fact that God holds everything together. The book of Hebrews begins this way and talks about 
that the very existence of, of humanity and really the, the existence of the universe is dependent upon God's ability to stay its power. And so um, the, the fact that uh, we don't just go flying off the planet, that gravity exists here, or the, the, the pitch of the, uh, of the, uh, the pitch and the rotation of the, of the earth, its rotation around the sun, the distance that we are from the sun, all these things that s sustain life, that if they weren't really exactly as they are or without very slight variation, all of, uh, all of the life on the planet, all life on the planet would die. And so um, that really helps us to understand that, that everything about this creation is 100% absolutely dependent on him and his existence. And without him, nothing would exist any longer. It would all be gone. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing because, again, you know, I, I guess I will give him this little benefit of the doubt, if you will. <sighs> to have to undergo what he underwent in those first two chapters and not having a satisfactory, in his mind, answer, and then crying out to God but not getting, again, what he would think is some kind of a reply from God would have to be kind of almost torturous. How do you deal with this? You have no answers. You don't understand why things are. They persist. And then there's the agitation and the irritation that comes from people who are, are pontificating on all kinds of things, none of which have any anything to do with reality and how frustrating that must be. So there's part of me that kind of, I don't give him a pass on it, but I can understand his frustration. And then God, in, in the way that he handles this, um, rather than just cleaning the slate and wiping him out, actually ends up vindicating Job compared to his counselors, though he has much that he wants to say to Job. And when Job actually gets his answer... Again, that, that list I gave you earlier, he got what he asked for. He's going to get a chance to plead his case. And the first time that he gets to actually answer anything, he's speechless. And of course he would be because, again, God asks a number of questions. They are rhetorical because Job has no answer for them. They cannot be answered. And God asks them in such a specific way. And he does so in a way of correction. But this is a, a great indication of, of the depths of God's love. He doesn't need to give any answers to Job, but he does so anyway. <clears throat> and he uses it as, a, if you will, a teachable moment to everyone. And think about it this way. Since it's recorded for us, it is also a teachable moment for everyone who reads this. So it is a, a kind of, um, uh, I, I guess you could just say it's, it's a novel in the way that God does what he does and how active he is and how much thought, as we would understand it, God put into the creation and how dependent it is upon him to sustain it at all times. And there are those, even among people that, that claim to be believers in the church, that think that somehow God started the whole operation. These are people who believe in what we would call theistic evolution, that um, they bought into the lie of evolution but they want to try to retain, if they could, some semblance of Christianity. So they believe that God started the process of evolution and kind of took a back seat in the whole thing. And, and the world is evolving like the atheist, Darwinist people believe in, in, uh, in that, that kind of a, a, you can't even call it creation, but our origins and how did we get here. So there's no way that you can take that, that belief seriously if you take the, the scripture seriously. There's not a person who takes the Bible uh, seriously or even literally, let alone literally, who would actually believe that kind of nonsense because God gives us the exact details in, in great specifics in the beginning chapters of the book of Genesis and the way that it's written doesn't leave any such option open to us. So once again, when God's able to answer for himself, he has some very intriguing things to say to Job. And uh, Job's reply, it's, it's, it's comical and it's tragic at the same time, if that makes any sense. So uh, what I want to do is dig into that. We start at chapter 38 today, and uh, there are some really, really cool things. So let's come before the Lord and let's ask that, uh, that he guides us in this study. Father, we thank you so much for your word and for what it instructs us. And we thank you that we have these closing chapters in Job because so many things have been said and so many assumptions have been made. And for those of us who do believe in your word and the accuracy of it and the completeness of it, we wouldn't reach the conclusions that Job had reached. And yet he had not seen you uh, for, for you and for who you are as we have. You've revealed so much more because of your word. 
not because we're special, but because time has gone on and so much has been revealed to us. But we are grateful as we read through these things as well, that it is a good reminder to us to see how involved you are in your creation and the fact that we come before you and study and, and ask of you by the Spirit that you would lead us and guide us in all study is because we do know you so much better than Job could have. And we've, we've had you revealed to us because of your Son, how grateful we are for those truths. And we pray that you would lead us and guide us in your word and in our study, and we ask it in Jesus' name. All right, so chapter 38, it says this, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, or, or storm, tempest, and, uh, and he said, who is this who darkens counsel? And the, the counsel that's being spoken of here was God's plan, what he was doing all along, that the, the entirety of everything that you read from chapter one, the rollout of all of these things was that there was a deliberate uh, a, a, a plan, if you will, that was in place. There was a purpose that God allowed all these things to happen. It wasn't just some random uh, sequence of events that was unknown to Job. One day everything's great, next day everything is horrible as though nobody's paying attention to what's taking place. So when God talks about this, who is this that darkens counsel? You're casting doubt on everything that has been going on, and God could say, even my involvement in all of this. And so this is said specifically to Job that he would understand what, what, what he has been saying all along and the presumptuousness of it. So God's going to hold him accountable, and that's what this these last five chapters are about. This is about accountability for people who have spoken without any kind of knowledge. And that's what you get in the second part of this, where he says they do this, and he's speaking specifically to Job, but the people listening, the ones who are his counselors, they're as guilty as he was. Who is this who darkens counsel or my plan or my purpose? By words without knowledge, you spoke presumptuously. You didn't know what you were saying. By words without knowledge. Now, prepare yourself like a man means gird yourself up and this is that kind of a, um, if you will, it's, it's like there will be, a, you've been asking for a, a way to contest yourself before God, Job, earlier in the book. You have pleaded with, uh, with the, the, or you have said you would like to plead your case, so now I'm asking you to do it. Gird yourself up. Stand like a man. Be prepared. So he says, and I will question you and you will answer me. So the second part of that, God already knows how this is going to work out. But the point is, you've made a lot of assumptions here, Job. So here I am. You've got what you asked for. Now prepare yourself because you're going to hear my answers and then you're going to have to give your reply. And Job's reply is, uh, I, it's not comical, but it is one of those things when you actually get a chance to see what God is actually up to, you're speechless. And in some small measure, I'm sure that we've all been in the same place. We run into those times when we may very well be very frustrated by circumstances. And we go through any number of things. And then at the end of it, it all makes a lot more sense once God is able to reveal what was going on in the, in the meantime. Frustrating, maybe even terrifying in the midst of it all. But after it's all said and done and it makes sense to us, we're able to see the big picture. And if we, like Job, made assumptions in that boy, do we have egg on our face at that point. And that's what is going to be happening here as God reveals these things. So he asks these questions. Now, again, rhetorical because there's no answer for them. But since Job is at the point where he's actually said things, I would love to give my counsel to God and, you know, basically explain to him how these things should be. And now God says, well, since you would be the one who could instruct me, then let me ask you some things, since you seem to be above it all and you have such a good grasp of these things. It's, it's not in a sarcastic sense, but it is really going to put Job in his place. So, Job, you've made some big presumptions about who I am, so let me ask you, since you know everything and since you've been there, why don't you tell me how I did these things? So, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And so he's thinking of like the structure of a building, the foundations. That's where everything starts. When, when God began to create everything, the foundations of it all, where were you when I began this whole process? Now, this goes back to the beginning of creation. So where were you when I did all of that? And, of course, the question is, is said in such a way that the absurdity of the question answers itself. <laughs> Job is a temporal human being. Of course he wasn't there. And the opening, if, if, if God said nothing else, just this sentence alone would have been enough for Job to go, I really, really made a mess of this, haven't I? I? I made assumptions 
about the eternal God, me, a mortal man, have made these assumptions. So it goes on, and it is brilliant. So he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? To, where, uh, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? So again, thinking of it in the terms of a building, this is how you would start the edifice, starting with the foundation, and then the structure itself. This is how you would, you would build it as he would understand. Now, God is using terms that he would understand because he's watched things being built, but God's using it in a way of describing the entirety of the universe starting with the earth. But everything from this point on is going to say the whole of creation, anything that you can take in with your eyes, all of it is dependent not only upon him to have created it, but for him to also to have sustained it. So the expanse of the universe, the far reaches of it, and it's our, our knowledge grows by the year. The size of it, the scope of it, the number of stars and galaxies, and just in, in it is even as much as we know about God from his word, still the the creative ability and genius of it is it's just beyond belief. How could anyone, how could God even make the things that that we see because they are so magnificent and that's not a question uh, it's, it's really not a way of trying to cast any doubt on God's ability it's just a testimony to how how finite we are and how little we are able to genuinely grasp with these finite minds the idea that there is a being we know him as God our father who put all of these things into motion and they declare his glory, as David tells us in Psalm 8. So, once again, God is just scratching the surface. I mean, just barely even scratching at the, the magnitude of his creation. So, again, he's asking this in such a way that it would be incredibly humbling to anyone who would hear it, let alone Job, because he's said a lot of presumptuous things. And God is beginning to answer him in ways that he will have no answer for Job, when he has to give account for this. So God is really putting these things in such a way, and I, I do believe it's very much loving and caring because he reconciles him at the end. But he wants him to really fully grasp the greatness. And, you know, let me say this too. I believe that there is, in this also, God preserved this book and the things happening in, in it that the generations to follow who may very well want to question God because life is not happening as they would want it to or thinks that it should, here is God saying, what I do is so far beyond your reckoning. So who are you to contend with me? At times, Job has said, look, I want to contend with him. I want to plead my case. And if I was able to plead my case, he would hear me and he would have to see my side of it. So there are those times when Job really, and again, I, I will give him a, a, somewhat of a pass on how horrible his circumstances are. And he's not getting answers. So to, in some ways, I can understand this that he would say the things that he says, and yet God does not give him a pass on those things, yet a loving God gives him answers, and it really is incredibly humbling to him, as we'll see. So, in verse 8, <clears throat> Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? So when I first created the waters and put them upon the earth, what was it that stopped them? So what kept them from continuing to overflow and, and actually covering the land? Who is the one who did that? When it burst forth and issued from the womb. When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And this is just, again, the things that you would see in the sky, the things that would be over the water during the day, the night, the clouds. It's just really a way of saying, when you look at the creation, who designed all of this? So again, Job would only be able to give one answer to any of these questions. You did those things. But he would have to say it also with the same lack of understanding that he had in his assumptions. His answers would also be without really understanding and knowledge. Because if, if he was to say, explain to me, this is God's way of saying, explain to me the physics of the creation. How is it that the water only goes so far? How is it that, that everything works and operates as it does? You explain it to me. Job and even anybody in our modern day with all of our advances still cannot even begin to grasp how it is that God, again, things like gravity, things like DNA, things like 
what keeps atoms from blowing apart and rather you know sticking together and, and creating molecules and, and things like that. How does this work? Well, we've got ideas, but there are still those times where it's like, yeah, but who holds it together other than God? The atheists have no, <clears throat> have no answers. The believers would say, God already started to explain this all the way back to Job. It's God who does those things. So he said, in, he says in verse 10, when I fixed my limit for it and I set bars and doors, when I said this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. God is the one who set the limitations. And it's that way with all of creation. Whatever it is that is here in the creation, it all has its limits because, again, all of creation is kind of interdependent. That uh, whether it's land, sea, sun, skies, rain, you know, lack of rain, all those things, they are all interdependent. And if they're operating like they're supposed to, then there's ample sun, there's ample rain, there's ample everything. And God is able to sustain it all at the same time. And the interdependence, again, all these things are dependent upon him. And they have to work together. Verse uh, 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that the dawn might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? So again, this is the cycle of day and night. How did that all work? How did that get put in place? So who is it that says that it's going to be dark for this many hours, but it'll be light for this many hours? And even the wicked who do their things in darkness are now made you know, visible by the light. So who's the one who did all of those things? Have you commanded? So he asks Job. Job, are you the one who has commanded morning since your days began? Now again, he had a he had a beginning. God does not. So he basically says, so then who set all these things in motion? Job would not be able to say me. But this is God's way of saying, well, you've made a lot of presumptions, so you tell me how it worked. Were you there when these things took place? So there's only one answer to that. And of course, as many of these questions, the way that they're framed, is Job would have to say, no, I wasn't there. So then the follow-up question to that was, well, then why do you make so many assumptions? Why don't you wait and see and be patient and that these things will then become known to you rather than make presumptions? So again, it's easy for us to look back in hindsight and say, gosh, Job, you shouldn't have made so many assumptions. But how guilty are we even with us knowing so much better about so many things than he could have known, because God's revealed himself, yet do we become impatient the same way and demand answers? And that's really what this has been. Job's in a place, I demand answers. Okay, well, now you got what you asked for, so here's, here's a bunch of questions. So, um, it, in verse 14, so this is the dawn, this is the creation, this is the light and dark. It takes its form like clay under a seal, and it stands out like a garment from the wicked. Um, their light is withheld, and uh, the upraised arm is broken. So that goes to man's pridefulness. But the, the it would be, uh, when you look at verse 14, the idea of clay and the, and the seal, these things were, were formless. They didn't have really any form to them, like clay would be, like you put on a letter or something that is sealed, but it doesn't take on any form until it is stamped, something that, that shows who it is who has made it, or there's an impression left on it. So just the raw material itself doesn't have any, any makeup. It needs to be designed and fashioned into something, very much like just a lump of clay would be a lump of clay until it has an impression put in it, and then it makes sense. And then as you go into verse 16, the, the idea that, that uh, the light and dark and how things are exposed, there's the literal of that, we also know that when we look at Jesus' words, the idea of light and darkness and how God brings illumination even towards the wicked, they are exposed because light is brought. Not, not necessarily just daylight, but light in the illumination of things. What are their motives? What are the reasons why they do what they do? So there is the literal revelation of it, and then there is the figurative as well, like what we're seeing here. So... Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked to search its depths? Have you gone into the ocean? Do you know how deep it is? And see, even now, it's the when we look at, at the sea and, and the things that are underwater in our world, with all of our advancements, most of the underwater world is, is unknown to us. And if we were starting to explore everything that we know about its depths, and some of it is miles deep underwater, and you can't even get things to it, the creatures that we might find there and, and all of that. It's just fascinating if you've ever watched documentaries on it. So he asks this, have you ever been able to do those things? And 
him saying no, which he would, he would have to say, of course I haven't. God would be able to say, well, not only can I and do I, but I was there when, when it was created because I was its creator. Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you been to the other side and made it back? Do you have the ability to go beyond the grave and then come back and do all those things? And, of course, God is not limited by such things. All of these are basically a way of saying, your limitations are not my limitations. Implied in that is so much of what has taken place in your life already, Job, is way beyond your capacity to understand. You can't go into the, the places where these these things could be understood, yet God patiently rebukes him in a way of, of just saying, how about all your presumption now when I start to answer some of these things? So again, these are the things that Job ultimately says, these were hidden from me. And so it wasn't that you withheld this knowledge from me. It's just, I didn't understand until you explained it. And when the explanation really is, I read it here and as I think I understand it, he's... <clears throat> The, the overriding thing, God is so much more involved in the day-to-day -day of the existence of life than, than Job had any idea about, and we should be as well. When God begins to say, look, all of creation is dependent upon me from moment to moment, and there's never a time when it's on autopilot. If God was not sustaining it in real time, all day, every day, from the beginning of creation, it would consume itself and it would fall apart in, instantly. When we think about this, when, when, uh, when we read that uh, everything melts with a fervent heat, when, when uh, Peter starts to talk about that, the day will come when the earth will be dissolved and it will melt with a fervent heat, what does that mean? Well, that means that God is recreating the creation. He's going to to you know uh, recreate everything back to its original way, but that means it's going to in, in some way, however it, it happens, the, the process is hard for us to understand, but God will do away with the temporary existence of things and usher back in the perfect and the eternal that has no corruption. So that means that it will take him to reconstruct everything the way that it is, or as we would understand it, if everything melts with a fervent heat, we start thinking nuclear. Well, as we understand what keeps atoms from blowing apart at the speed of light, no one knows. God does. And if he says, I'm going to quit holding it all together, I'll just let it all dissolve. Then he can recreate everything, the new heaven and the new earth that we read about in Revelation. Not a problem for him. He's able to do all that. What about us? Will we be burned up? Well, clearly not, because we're mentioned as being there at the end. So he preserves and protects us as well. The things that people can become worried about are just like, did you think God didn't think of that? <laughs> he's, he's obviously... He knows exactly what he's doing. And here, Job is getting a firsthand accounting of all of that. So, <clears throat> he says this. Have you uh, comprehended the breadth of the earth in verse 18? Tell me if you know all of this. Do you, do you comprehend it? Can you even take in the immensity just of the earth, let alone the universe? And of course, there's, there's only one answer. No. Verse 19. Uh, where is the way of the dwelling of light? Where does it come from? Where does it, what's, what's its source, right? And we would know from Genesis, God said, let there be light and light was. And darkness, where is its place? That you may take, uh, take it to its territory, that you may know the paths of its home. Did you know it because you were born uh, back then? Or because of the number of your days, because they're so great? This is God's way of saying, all the way back when I created light, when I said light be and light was then you can understand where it's, what its source is, or darkness, or any of the rest of it. Where does it come from? What's the path that it takes? All of that stuff. This is basically the, the essence of God's creation from the very, very beginning. Explain to me how all of this works, because it's not random. It all had very, very specific intent behind it, and God saw to the plan and to the pattern and to the creation. And so you could just say, all right, God, when, when do you want to stop? Because you've made your point. Well, he's He's just getting warmed up. So, have you entered the treasury of snow, or have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle, and for war? And there are those times when God would even use the natural uh, things, the natural um, parts of creation, and there were times when, when floods would come, or even there were hailstones that were sent, and then not necessarily snow. Sometimes they're actually flaming things. And so the idea that God could use 
the things of his creation, even in the ways of judgment. It's just an added layer of him saying, not only are these things, do they happen somewhat naturally as they would see it, but God created those things and even uses his creation to bring about his purposes. So he says this verse 24, by, um, by what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth? Things that he would know and recognize. Again, this is part of their creation, part of the, the world that they live in. Where do those things come from? So like the breeze that comes in. We understand, you know, weather patterns now and all the rest of it. But for somebody like this, and even that, you know, well, yeah, we understand that weather patterns will move through an area, high and low pressures and all that stuff, the meteorological things. And yet at the same time, but who governs them? They happen without anybody making them happen as in our world today. We just know that they're coming, but this goes far beyond that. Who created them in the first place? And who governs them that they go from one place to the next? That's what's being really ex uh, explained to him here or making him come to an understanding of it for himself. Verse 25, who has divided a channel for the overflow of water? When there's a flood comes, where does it go and how does it go off? And so elevations and all the rest of that, but again, who made all of those things? When water overflows, what channel does it take in order to get to the lowest lying area? So, and um, <clears throat> the wilderness in which uh, there is no man. So, I'm sorry, verse 25, read it again. Uh, who has divided a channel for the overflow of water or a path for the thunderbolt? And we live in Texas now, and we see this all the time. What is it that makes when, when lightning, first of all, um, goes, what is it that directs its path? Because you'll, you'll see them go off. Sometimes we'll see them going across the clouds. They never come to the ground. But again, they never. there's no two that are alike. That's just a way of him saying, so who's the one that directs where they go and when and how and distance and all of that? So it's just, it's, it's magnificent what he says. He says this, um, to cause it to rain on a land where there is no man, a wilderness in which there is no the, uh, no one or a wilderness where there is no man. So his way of saying the, the rain and, and everything that sustains life, I do that even where man doesn't exist because there are animals and there is, it's just, it's the entirety of the earth. These things take place. So he says this, it is to, to satisfy the desolate waste and to cause spring, uh, to spring forth the growth of tender grass. Has the rain a father or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost from heaven? Who gives it birth? The waters harden like a stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. So interesting. So he just pretty much says all these things of the for of the known universe explain where they come from. And this is just again these these are all rhetorical things. He asks these questions knowing Job has no answer for them, and since he has no answers for them, all that he can say is. Well, God, you're the creator of those things. You're the only one who knows them. And so the humility that, that this would cause comes across in what Job ultimately ends up saying. But this is just God saying, just as a, as a perusal through some things, here is for you to consider. Now he says this, Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Maseroth in its seasons? Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the, the uh, ordinances of the heavens or the laws of the heavens, how they operate? Can you set the dominion over the earth? And what this gives the impression, they understood, in, as far as astronomy was concerned, they understood when they looked up at the skies that the stars, where they were positioned in the skies, would tell you it's the beginning of the uh, of, of different seasons. And it was the, the binding up of one season, it was going away, but the revealing of another uh, season that was coming. And they could tell because of the uh, astronomy, the things that were in the sky. And this is not referring to astrology or somehow that you would govern your life based upon the planets. That's occultic, that is pagan. And so when you see Maseroth, some people start to think Zodiac. But we all know that the nonsense of that, that somehow stars and, uh, and planets can somehow affect your day-to-day -day life is just silliness in the extreme, based even on what we see here. It's God who governs these things, not the stars and the moons and the effect that it would have. What he's getting here is these celestial bodies. When you see them and you know that things are about to change, again, you can't make one season go into the next. You're not able to bind and loose the, the effects that are there. That's what seems to be the case here. Because once again, look at everything else that we've read in context. It's about how the, the creation itself functions in a pattern. 
it functions in such a way and its interdependence upon you know the other parts doing what they're supposed to the rain the sun the the hail the the snow all these things they all play a, a, a an important part in the sustaining of life the way that it is so again the idea that can you cause one season to go into another and that they would know the change of the seasons by the the celestial things the things that they could see the stars in the sky so it's not intended to be um, some kind of astrological uh, uh, you know kind of uh, occultic kind of a thing like you might see now there are some people who've done some very interesting um, uh, studies into I think Bollinger was one of them but um, uh, the the celestial bodies would would speak of the gospel and so you've heard people do things like the gospel in the stars and again it, it's interesting it's intriguing but uh, I don't spend a great deal of time into it because it, it calls for some speculation and that is not what he's getting at here what he's getting at here is the changing of seasons and how things continue to operate in the existence of the creation that's the context of what he has said here so to think he's going to some leap of directing him towards celestial things or the astronomy of it and how it plays into the day-to-day -day of life beyond just the change of seasons I think is a bit of a stretch so verse 36 can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you can you cr can you call for rain you know without me answering that you can't do it yourself you don't have the power verse 35 can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you here we are who has put wisdom in the mind or who has given understanding to the earth i love that just the you know who gives wisdom and who is it that even gives the the thought the, that the mind can grasp and understand these things so even as he asks these things so job you were obviously there when i did all these things so why don't you explain it to me just the fact that job could go i don't understand a thing means that god has put wisdom into his mind <laughs> let your mind think about that one for a moment just really cool who has put wisdom in the mind or who has given understanding to the heart who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can pour out the bottles of heaven these are things that only he can do who can number the amount of or the number of clouds or who can pour out rain when the dust hardens in clumps and uh, and clods cling together can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or they lurk in their lairs and life in wait who provides food for the raven when its young one cries to it uh, to God and wander about for lack of food so who sees to these things so again this is a way of just job having to come to this obvious conclusion that man has no no work to do in this process these are things they are the dominion they are the domain of god and he alone is the one who does these things so god begins this 38th chapter by just asking a series of rhetorical questions and because they're rhetorical, because they have no answer other than no or yes, one word type things, but no ability for explanation, this is God basically holding Job accountable for the things that he has said, but it's also said in a way not just of accountability, but of correction as well. And this will change the way that Job looks at things. Already at this point, it will have had to have had that effect on him, because once again, all of the things that have happened means that that uh, it didn't happen without his notice if God can sustain the most almost seemingly mundane things that we take for granted then he clearly knows when calamity befalls his creation like it has happened to Job so there's there's an answer without an answer if you will it's it's a it's a it's an implied thing if Job was to say yeah but why were you not paying attention well clearly he was because all these other things operate all day every day and without him they could not operate so it answers that question in a roundabout way um, chapter 39 do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young or can you mark when uh, the deer gives birth can you number the months that they are fruitful or that they fulfill rather or do you know the time when the bear uh, when they bear young do you know the cycles of things do you know when all of that now see they can look at they you know we do know seasons when those those things can end up happening but do you know that with intricacy 
when those things take place and and do you know the whole process of it of course because these are things that are, you're not seeing when they're happening it's one thing for domesticated animals but it's another thing when they're not and yet those things take their place they take their course man's not involved with it he doesn't have to watch over them they just these things happen on their own they bow down they bring forth their young they deliver their offspring their young ones are healthy they grow strong with grain they depart and they do not return to them this whole cycle over which man has no dominion whatsoever. He doesn't see to it. He doesn't make these things happen. These are not domesticated things. They happen on their own. Now, we could say on their own because of nature. No, they happen on their own because God governs those things. And so when we hear things like Mother Nature, as a Christian, I cringe when I hear that for a couple of reasons. It gives the impression of just simple randomness, but more importantly, it robs God of who he is. There is no mother nature. There is only Father God, and he does the things that he does, and he oversees all of these things. Now, we know that it talks about Jesus as being the agent by which these things take place. Uh, Colossians 1, 16, 17, down through the, uh, I think around through chapter 20, 21, verse 21, rather, I should say. And then the first few verses of the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, again, he is intimately involved, Jesus himself, as creator, which we know that he is, according to John 1, 3, and other places. Um, but his involvement in the creation as well is not to be misunderstood, but understood. So, verse 5. Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager, which is the wild ox? And so these animals that just roam free, they're not domesticated, they just... They're, they're free to do what they do. And this is much of the much of the wildlife in the world is not domesticated. And so this is his way of saying, it's one thing if, if man could try to take credit for domesticated animals for their well-being, make sure that they're fed, that they have water, that they have safe place, that their young have a place to grow up without predators, all that stuff, great. That's That speaks of a small amount of the overall of what is there in creation. Whose home have I made, uh, have made, I'm sorry, whose home I have made in the wilderness and the barren lands his dwelling. He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture and he searches out every green thing. So that's it doesn't require anything from man in order for these things to take place. So it is the, this animal does what it does based on the instinct that God gave it to go and to search these things out, and then God provides for those things. Remember, he's already said, I send rain into the desolate places where there are no men. It's not that, that I do that to sustain the life of man. I sustain all of creation, whether man is present or not, whether animal is domesticated or wild. And this is, again, for Job to realize, he really doesn't have any stake in this. He doesn't have any, man does not have any part with any of this. So it says, so he scorns that, I love this, he scorns the tumult of the city in verse 7. He does not shout, uh, heed the shouts of the driver. So where man congregates, doesn't care about it. He scorns it. I hate that, you know, the idea of that coming to heal or being domesticated. I can't stand it. The range of the mountain is his pasture, as it says in verse 9. So it says in verse 9, will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he be, um, will he bed by your manger? Will he Will he voluntarily come under your dominion? Of course not. So can you bind the wild ox and the furrow with ropes? That idea that you would have him go and plow your fields. Are you going to take a wild ox to do it? Or do you need the domesticated ones that are born in your domestication? And then from one generation of those animals to another, you train them from their infancy. But try to go grab an adult ox and put a yoke on him and tell him to plow your fields. It's ridiculous. Will you trust him because his strength is great? And so would you would you make this attempt because he's full grown? No, he's just going to do what he does. Or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it for your threshing floor? Again, how are you going to bring a full grown wild animal into subjection to you? You're going to try this? You want to give it a shot kind of a thing? And it's, it's a way of just Job going... What have I done? What have I said? And, you know, just that I want a place to hide kind of a thing. So this is great. I love this one. This reminds me years ago, 
um, we were uh, in Tucson and we got a behind the scenes um, uh, walk through the zoo there in Tucson. And we came to the ostrich and the zookeeper um, just said, he goes, these animals are so unbelievably stupid. It's hard to imagine. And so, you know, I'd never been around them, so I don't know. I just asked the question. I said, well, why do you suppose that is? He goes, well, look at the size of the animal, but look at the size of the head and how big is the brain? <laughs> so that was his way. And again, he was an evolutionist. So he didn't see it the same way that we did. Here is where God actually, I mean, he singles out the ostrich for how dumb they are. That's an interesting thing. Look at this. The wings of the ostrich, they wave proudly, but her wings are, um, and her pinions are, uh, are they like the kindly stork? So this big, massive winged bird, if you will, uh, has these big wing, wings and everything else, but because it's so big, it can never take flight. And the length of its legs, obviously, it's, it's not intended to fly. This is the way that God had made them. And again, when you look at the ostrich, you might go, how on earth and why are those things here? And they are like so many of the animals that just don't make any sense. And yet they, they speak of God's creative genius because they break the mold. So it, it's one of those things where you'd say, well, well clearly, if this was an evolutionary thing, um, there would be no reason for them to have evolved this way because they just don't fit the pattern. So the idea that they're created the way that they are, again, speaks that God says, I don't have to, to work according to wisdom. Sometimes things are put there just to make you go, why? Well, he answers the question about the ostrich. Four, here's, um, um, is she anything like the stork, the one who can fly and all the rest of it? She's nothing like that. She leaves her eggs on the ground and she warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern. So again, when, when you think about how it is that since they can't fly, they can't put their nests up in trees. And so they're going to put them among places where they're maybe not necessarily recognizable. You might put them in the grass and whatnot, but they're, they're easy to, to fall victim to prey. They can be <clears throat> trampled. She doesn't know what's going on with them. And it seems from the, the observations, it's like she doesn't even care about those things. How, how careless must you be to just have your offspring put in the grass and then you leave them alone and whatever happens, happens. So why would she do such things? Well, <laughs> verse 17 says, because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. There's your answer. Why are ostriches so stupid? Because God made them that way. Deliberately, it says, because God deprived her, did not endow her. When she lifts herself up on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. And at the same time that God didn't give her wisdom, <clears throat> when it comes to her ability, when she takes flight, she'll, she'll go as high up as she is. She's taller than we are, most. And uh, she can outrun a horse. She's not worried about them. So... As dumb as this animal is, and with everything that God robbed her of, or didn't take, didn't give her, I shouldn't say robbed, but didn't give her like he gave to so many other kinds of animals, she'll outrun a horse and doesn't even think twice about it. So again, this, this paradox of how God created what he created and how it doesn't to our own mind make a great deal of sense. So he says this, have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His, um, his majestic snorting strikes terror. His paws in the valley and rejoice he paws in the valley and rejoices in its in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. So right after speaking about the ostrich, he now goes into the horse. Just looking at a few examples of the creation, and there are so many that he could use, and he's going to use plenty of others too. But this is said again for Job to take it all in and to look and say, he really is so much greater than we give him credit for, and yet it's very easy not to pay attention to these things. So by God asking these questions in the rhetorical sense, to which again, there's really no reason for answer, the, the answer is obvious. At the same time, it is, it is an answer to Job for all of the things that he has said. And if I could just kind of briefly paraphrase a number of them. 
does God not pay attention to what's going on? Does he not see what's happening to me? Does he not understand the difficulties? Does he not understand the problems that I face? And that, you know, if I could only plead before him, I would be able to explain to him the problems and he'd be able to reconcile these things because he's just not paying attention. So if that's just, you know, if I could really encapsulate many of the things that Job said repeatedly in different ways, that kind of just, that's an overview of it. But he can say here, let me give you a few examples of the animals that you see here. The wild ox, the donkey, the horse, the ostrich. They're all so different, and yet when he looks at the, the how majestic a horse would be and how powerful and, and their abilities, yeah, you might have them outrun by an ostrich, but when you start to think about a horse, they're just... They're so they're so powerful. They're so you know grand. They're so majestic, and their their abilities and their 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 they're so grand. I guess just a way of putting it. So it says, he mocks at fear, and is not frightened. Nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, and the glittering spear and the javelin. Uh, the um, the quiver rattles against him. The glittering spear and the javelin. Uh, the glittering spear is lance. So all of these implements of war, they don't trouble him. The fact that there is, if there is a war and, he, and uh, he's being ridden, he doesn't shy away from those things. He just does as he, you know, is commanded by the, the writer. He just does what he's supposed to do. Fear does not grip him. It says, um, he devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet has sounded. That doesn't trouble him. It puts fear in men, perhaps, but the horse isn't, he's immune to that. At the blast of the trump, he says, aha, like, let's, it's time to go. Uh, he smells the battle from afar and the thunder of captains and of shouting. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom? So now let's move to birds, the hawks. These are, again, when you think about the predators, the majestic, the hawks, and the, the birds of prey are so amazing when you look at them. They just look so awesome and fierce, even though they're smaller than us. Still, when you look at them, they're just, birds of prey in particular, are so impressive to look at. So he asks this question, does the hawk fly by your wisdom? Do you have anything to do with it? Are you the one who has designed him as I have designed him? And he spreads uh, and spread its wings towards the south. Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? Are you the one who is responsible for that, Job? As any of these, these things. Who's responsible for this, Job, you or me? Since you've got and made all your presumptions, if you could only plead your case because you know these things and somehow I don't or I haven't been paying attention. Now let me just ask you a series of these questions. Now he's moved on to birds. So on the rock it dwells and it resides. On the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there, it spies out the prey. Its eyes observe from afar, and its young ones suck up, um, young ones suck up blood. And uh, where the slain are, there it is. And so, wherever there is plunder, and so whether it is the prey that it has sought out for itself, or whether it's sometimes that God would call the birds to uh, to um, um, take away or to consume the carcasses of those that have died in battle. Same thing. It's that idea that, that once again, who makes provision for all of these examples of all of these animals? So the, the, up, the, the, the way to, to, to view these things, God is just saying the day-to-day -day operation of the whole of creation, things that you never even think about until they're brought to your attention, Job, the donkeys, the ostrich, the horse, the eagle, the hawk, all of those things. Do you give any, any thought to how those things operate? And even if you gave thought, could you do anything to govern it? And of course, Job, Job would have to say, of course not. God would be able to say, I ask that just so that it brings you to that understanding. I oversee all such things. They're part of my design. They are part of my purpose. Even what's happened to you, Job, there's a reason, there's a plan, and there's a purpose behind it. Yet God does not make it known um, what those things are, at least as far as the explanation that he gives. He doesn't explain what was the accusation of chapters 1 and 2. That doesn't get explained here. Now, does it get explained at a different time to Job? Perhaps, more than likely, but not from the record that we have here. So, we don't want to go into assumptions or anything else. It's just very, very, it's an interesting possibility. It's an interesting thought. So what we'll do is we'll, we're going to end there. 
We're going to pick up next week at uh, chapter 40, which is basically, um, I'll just read the first couple of verses. Moreover, the Lord answered and said to Job, Shall the one who contends with Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. So after those two chapters, now he turns to Job and says, Since you've asked for correction, or since you've asked for this meeting, if you will, and since you want to give correction, here's your chance. So Job is then at that point addressed and says, now is your time to speak. <laughs> Without even reading it, I think we can all assume, yeah, I think I know what he's going to say. It's like, I, I have nothing to say. The thing that he has been looking forward to, if only I could plead my case. Now God says, I'm going to give you a chance to answer, but let me ask you some questions first, and you're going to answer me. So this is <laughs> the, the roles are reversed here. I want God to answer my questions. Now God says, okay, we're going to get to that, but I'm going to have you answer some questions first. Since you have sent some things that has really cast doubt on, on me and have, have put my decisions into a bad light, now it's your turn to answer. So fascinating, fascinating stuff. So we'll pick up at, um, at chapter 40 next week, and uh, we'll finish out the book. We'll take care of chapters 40 through 42. And, uh, and then if, if there is anything that I've mentioned in this study or really in any of the ones that you see, you can always get in touch with us through the ministry's website, which is oldpaththeology.net. And uh, at the website there, there is a place, a contact us tab, and you're able to click on that, and it'll get the email opened up that you can send to me, and I answer the emails. So with that, we will pick up um, next week at chapter 40 and complete the book of Job, and we'll be moving on to Psalms after that, and then Proverbs as we work our way through the Old Testament. We take it in a book-by-book -book manner. And so I look forward to sharing that with you next week. And um, if you want to read ahead, please do so. There are some very intriguing things because there are some animals that are mentioned that we don't know who they are. And frankly, it's kind of sad to watch some people, professing believers, um, reach some of the conclusions that they do. And so uh, I don't want to go too far into that, but uh, we will examine that in the, in the next study. So we'll pick it up next week at Chapter 40. Mm -hmm.